G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today we're gonna to do a team focus video. I said I would do this during the week and I wanted to take a closer look at what's happening at the Western Bulldogs, a club where there is a whole stack of pessimism and negativity, both externally and coming from their fans as well. And with all the conjecture around Luke Beveridge and whether he should be coach, whether they're trending in the right direction, I thought it'd be interesting to take a bit of a deep dive on the Western Bulldogs, who currently sit 11th on the ladder, three wins, five losses at 111%, so very healthy percentage. I think of the teams above them, like they've got a better percentage than like four of the five teams above them. So that bodes well. They've had three wins this year over West Coast, Gold Coast, and St. Kilda. All of those sides are probably in the bottom eight to six at the moment. Their losses have been against Melbourne and Geelong, two quality sides. Essendon, who are playing very good football at the moment. The Dockers are also in the top eight. They lost to them in Perth. And then most recently, they lost to Hawthorne, has left a particularly sour taste in the mouths of their fans. I've been doing a lot of reading of um, Bulldogs fan forums and stuff like that. And you can understand why. It feels like going into this season, the pressure on beverage has been palpable. There's a level of expectation based on the quality of their list and probably a bit of frustration that they've sort of lingered around the fringes of the top eight since the 2021 grand final. And, you know, frankly, in the entire period, the Bulldogs were good. It still didn't really translate in like high home and away finishes. So in this video, I'm, I've kind of done a bit of a stat deep dive on the Western Bulldogs, what we're seeing and looking at their list as well, the composition of it. And, you know, I have to say, I had some preconceived notions about it. In some ways, doing this has changed my mind a little bit on the Bulldogs. But one thing that has to be said, one thing that has to be pointed out here is there is a lot of frustration about their ability to win close games. So I read somewhere that they are now one in seven. So one win, seven losses in games decided by seven points or less since uh, I think the start of last year. And that is the sort of stuff that stats will be hard to translate in. You look at a lot of the numbers in this video and a lot of it's positive and a lot of the list composition stuff is positive, but that sort of stuff, those results, those tough losses, those close losses against teams that they should be beating, that's what stays with fans and probably is you know the number one driver and a lot of the frustration around the Western Bulldogs at the moment. Now, before we get into the stats deep dive, I do want to clarify some comments I've made in a video that hasn't even released yet. So I made a video, I do this once a month, AFL Unpopular Opinions, and there was a question around Bevro and uh, the Western Bulldogs list. And I made a few flippant comments about some players that I thought weren't going so well this year. And I sort of implied that Bailey Williams, Jason Johannesson, and Bailey Dale, you know, weren't the players that they once were. And, you know, I, I looked at the stats to try and support that claim in this video and I thought, ooh, I think I've got those comments wrong. Probably misdiagnosed, shooting off the hip a little bit. When I look at the stats, these guys are actually having decent years. You know, Bailey Williams is 18 possessions at 86% efficiency. Johannesson's output is up on previous years. Bailey Dale as well, I think is ranked like third or fourth by champion data at the moment. And I know champion data can spit out some weird results, but the justification they had was that he's a very high meters gained, very much a move the ball towards the goal sort of player. And I, I was correct in saying that I thought he got dropped. I think he got relegated to, to sub once. But either way, I'm not going to make that claim again. He's actually having a good year. So the video hasn't dropped yet. It's going to drop soon. Uh, I have to wait for approval from the sponsor of the video, but I do know that I'm going to get some comments for that. And, and fair enough. I just want to clarify those before that comes out. I have a very interesting relationship with Bulldogs fans. I think out of all the 18 clubs, the Bulldogs and maybe Adelaide are the two clubs they probably have the most dissatisfaction about what I have to say about their team. So hopefully in this video, I can make up some ground in that respect. You take out the most recent Hawthorne loss, and that is, we see the profile of a team that is smack bang in the middle of the ladder, and that's mostly what they have proven this year. We don't know about Essendon yet. That was a particularly poor loss. And against the Hawks, I think the Hawks played well. We still expect the Bulldogs to win that game. Now, that was an interesting game where a lot of the stats were even, I was trying to deep dive, you know, where they lost it. And again, I was listening to SEN and they said, Hawthorne are like the sixth best team ever at post-stoppage ground ball, hard ball gets or something like that, which is ultimately where the Bulldogs got slaughtered in that game. It's an interesting stat in itself. The other five teams ahead of them were all teams that either won the flag that year, were great teams like Essendon in 2000, Geelong, or teams that were about to go on a serious run at finals and the premiership, and Hawthorne is the outlier there. It's also interesting looking at the stat of ground ball gets um, across the league. The top five teams, there is a really strong inverse correlation with teams that are high on the ladder and teams that are doing well in that stat. I think the top 
top five are like Hawthorne, Fremantle, West Coast. St Kilda's in there. I want to say Brisbane's close. I'm not sure about Richmond, but either way, weird stat. But anyway, we'll move on. Whatever way you slice it, losing to Hawthorne in that manner is disappointing, and you can understand the frustration of fans who believe that they should be playing better. There's a mountain of pressure already on the club to succeed. And I suppose, you know, doing this video and looking at this list kind of changed my tune onto whether the expectation on this Western Bulldogs side to, you know, be a top four side and, and push for flag contention is completely justified. I'm not saying they're not talented, but, you know, when you consider who are their truly elite players right now, for me, Bond and Pelly is the best player in the game. And you have to say Liberatore is a truly elite, you know, clearance midfielder. So I'd give them those two. But a lot of their best players are, are still in that under 24 bracket. Players that you are, you assume and, and are very comfortable in assuming are going to be top line players. It's still early for them. So what we're seeing is a list that is actually quite similar to West Coast in that it's top and bottom heavy. Some of their best contributors, some of their best talents are, you know, towards the end of their careers. And then you have this burgeoning group of under 24s that I think is really strong. The Western Bulldogs have hit the draft really hard over the last few years and it's showing. So that's a long-winded way of pointing out that as far as teams go in terms of like players in their prime, the Western Bulldogs actually don't have that many. So when we talk about, you know, the side needing a rebuild, I I'm very strongly don't believe they need a rebuild because I think they have a really strong group of under 24 talents. We might have maybe misfired a little bit by saying this side is the profile of a team that should be in the top four. Having said all that, uh, should they be playing better? Yes, I, th I think what's like plagued this side is the tendency to lose games where they're in winning positions or, you know, finals are on the line. Like I think back to the end of last year, they lost to Hawthorne late in the season. They lost to West Coast late in the season. Those two losses would really stick out in their minds. I think against the Giants, who obviously ended up being in a great team that year, I think they got like six goals in front. They were like five goals up at halftime. So again, this is the stuff that stats don't demonstrate that really builds that frustration. So I've run some stats on the Western Bulldogs, trying to find little trends and, and trying to translate exactly how well we think they're going this year. So interestingly, they're the number one side for overall possessions. So they're getting their hands on the footy more so than any other team. They're also second in the league for disposal efficiency. So they're getting more of the ball and they're using it relatively well. Interesting outlier stat here, Geelong are ranked 18th for disposal efficiency. No single stat is going to be telling in that sense, uh, but either way, it's kind of an odd thing to happen, to win more of the ball than anyone else and still use it better than 16 other clubs. However, one thing that undermines this a little bit, they are the fifth last team in ratio of kick to handball. So what we're seeing is they're winning a lot of uncontested ball. They are the number one uncontested of all side. They're handballing it a lot more than they're kicking it. They're hitting their targets. Long story short, their ball movement is super stagnant if you're looking at these stats. I also consider them in my head a very strong midfield, a very strong clearance side. However, they're actually only slightly above average for clearances in terms of clearance di uh, differential, despite the fact that Liberatore is ranked second in the league for clearances per game. Bontempelli is also having a pretty damn good year. Again, I probably undersold how well he was playing. Again, I, I looked through the stats more in depth for this particular video. He's still having a good year. Important caveat, Liberatore has you know been subbed out twice and, and missed the third game. So that will affect the clearance average. And also little things like Bontempelli, you know, playing a lot more forward against teams like West Coast because you know they were saving him. And I think West Coast leveled the clearances that game. But they're top six in the league for inside 50 differential, you know, getting the ball inside 50 more so than they're conceding it. So that's actually a really good stat considering they're 11 on the ladder, but six in that particular stat. Now I wanted to have a look at like how they are defensively, like particularly around the ground. So there's a few contradictory stats here. They're fifth worst in the league for conceding opposition rebound 50. So that means they're getting the ball in fine, but only four teams in the league are worse at keeping the ball inside their forward 50. However, the thing that contradicts this, they are the number one team for tackles inside 50. They're fifth in the league for tackles overall. So their actual tackling game is fine, but where they rank 16th in the league is overall pressure act. So what, what's that telling us? They're pretty good at laying tackles, but there's an implied lack of pressure, you know, in all other situations. And the other teams are getting the ball outside their forward 50 relatively easy. They're also fifth in the league from scores from stoppages. Now, this particular stat does have a very high correlation with the latter right now. The best teams in the league generally do well in this stat. So that's a statistical breakdown of how the Western Bulldogs are going at the moment. There's a lot of stats that are in the right direction and no team stat profile is absolutely perfect. I mean, look at Geelong, the worst team in the league for disposal efficiency. There's no doubt there's been some, you know, 
positional magnet moving by beverage over the last couple of months. And, you know, one that comes to mind is Ed Richards being one of the best defenders in the league as a running defender and defensive ground ball gets. He ranks really highly in. He's been moved to the midfield in the last three weeks and his output's definitely decreased. We've seen Jack McRae spend less time at stoppages, you know, decreasing over a number of years now. And he, along with someone like a Caleb Daniel, at one point, these guys look like they were going to be long-term players. And they are long-term players, but long-term high-contributor key players for the Western Bulldogs that have fallen off. And this does happen. I mean, I've seen it with my own club in particular. But I do think those two players dropping off has probably maybe curtailed the Western Bulldogs actual premiership window. Someone like a Jack McRae has been played a little bit out of position for sure. Over the last month, he's only attended 30% of center bounces. He's spending more time on the outside. He's going at 20 possessions a game. Like it wasn't that long ago, he was a fantasy pig. He's using the ball well, 82% efficiency, but very, very low meters gained. Caleb Daniel has also fallen out of favor. He's played forward, he's been dropped. Like this is uh, unhelpful. So to translate, I guess everything I've said so far, we're seeing a team that is top and bottom heavy in terms of their list profile don't have that many players in their actual prime, aside from the best player in the competition, that are trending okay in a lot of stats, but have this tendency to lose games that they shouldn't be losing, leading to fan frustration. They've still got a very good call. Bontempelli, Liberatore, Aaron Norton is, is kicked two goals a game this year and entering his prime, he's been pretty good. Trelaw as well was having a pretty good year. There's been comments about his ball use, but generally speaking, like in terms of the midfield contribution, he's going all right. Ed Richards is a star. Cody Waitman I haven't even mentioned yet. He's a fantastic small forward and probably trends to be an elite small forward before too long. Bailey Dale's also had a great year. And then there's this, the middle tier, Guys like McRae have dropped off. Caleb Daniels dropped off. Rory Lobb, I mean, has he ever been good at the Bulldogs yet? I don't mean to throw shade, but maybe that one's probably put in its own bucket. So the support around that top tier group hasn't really been there. And then I think there's a big gap to, you know, some of their best young talent. Now, this is worth mentioning because the Western Bulldogs are very well placed for long-term in my personal opinion. I'll rattle off some of the young talent this team has compiled. So Riley Sanders, I know that he's been, you know, in and out of the team and, and made sub and stuff. I don't think that's a big deal. The kid's 18. I, don't, I actually think there's a strong argument not to put your young midfielders at the coalface from day dot, even if he might seem ready. We, we want to consider his long-term future. Jamari Hugo Hagen's one of the best young key forward prospects in the league. Sam Darcy's having a great year, kicked a goal in every game this year already a better player than Rory Lobb. Like he, he will be a good player. They added Jordan Croft, a first round draft pick last year as another key forward. James O'Donnell is a very good young key back prospect. Jed Buzzlinger, I still think will be a good player. So what I like about this mix is a lot of them are tall. And that's when you're doing a rebuild, not that the Bulldogs are rebuilding as such, but you want to probably pick your tools first. And I think they're well and truly stocked in this department. Buku Kamas looks like a likely type. Cody Waitman's 23. Aaron Norton, 24, turning 25 this year. So as far as a young group goes, like I am not expecting the Bulldogs to need to plummet down the ladder. Even if you know things go pear-shaped this year, even if they get a new coach, before too long, this Western Bulldogs team will be good again, in my opinion. There is still a cliff coming. There is a very top-heavy part of their list and you envisage that a number of players are probably gonna finish up before too long. So Liam Jones is 33. I have no idea how close he really is to the end. Duray is 33. He probably is in his last year of a thought. Liberatore is nearly 32. Now that's the concerning one because he's still playing well. He's one of their best players, probably their second best player this year. And the concussion stuff, I don't want to go down that path too much, but that stuff, you know, we, we know what that can lead to. So that'll be tricky. Johannesson turns 32 post-season. Rory Lobb is 31, being rumored to get traded to Collingwood. Trelaw is 31, and, you know, whatever you say about Trelaw at the moment, there are some mixed opinions out there. He's still one of their better contributors. Jack McRae is nearly 30. So regardless of how good that group is, and I think Alex Keith is around that age too, Still a lot of players that are probably going to finish up over the next year or two. So what the Bulldogs do with their list will be quite interesting. Now, we know that they're going to be in the thick of trade and free agency against their will to some extent because they've signed Jamari Hugo Hagen. That's not a big surprise. Glad to see him commit to the club. I think Bailey Smith is gone. I think that seems to be the prevailing belief out there that he's probably played his last game for the Western Bulldogs. And that is a blow. Whatever way you slice it. I mean, you don't want to keep players at your club that don't want to be there, if that if that is indeed the case. I am, there's an educated speculation to, to that, but if Bailey Smith recommitted to the club and stuck around, I still think he projects as a genuine A-grade midfielder, and that group, 
of young talent that I didn't even include Bailey Smith in gets even stronger. As it happens, my personal prediction, which is only worth <laughs> so much, is that they'll probably end up trading him to Geelong for at least one first round pick, maybe a couple, depending on if Geelong win the flag. Tim English, again, I've no idea how likely this is. I don't think he'll end up at West Coast, which has been the strongest rumor out of any club. Again, another player they want to keep. I think, I reckon they'll lose Smith and maybe keep English, but again, that's not what this video is about. And then Rory Lobb to Collingwood, I think this is a no-brainer. Um, I think they've got Sam Darcy in this team. They've got Jordan Croft. I don't think they need Rory Lobb, and uh, I don't think that's really worked out. So let's conclude this rambling nonsense I've made about the Western Bulldogs here. Overall, when we're looking at how we're assessing the Bulldogs and the level of expectation, Doing this analysis has led me to believe I think this is actually a team in transition and not a team we should be expecting to be a contender. Now, when you've got players like Bontempelli, Libratore, Aaron Norton, Jamari Hagen, there is always the possibility that they, you know, make the finals and maybe, you know, mix things up when they're there because they do have a track record of playing well in finals when they get there, particularly in 2021 and, of course, 2016. But overall, if we're expecting this team to be mixing it with the Ds and the Cats this year, I mean, they got close to beating the Cats, they got well beaten by the Ds, maybe that expectation is a little bit unjustified because I think this team is in transition. They're probably going to have access to the draft again this year. Yes, they've traded out their future first, well, their current first, but with the number of players leaving, especially if Tim English goes, because that would probably trigger ban one, I would have thought. But certainly through Bailey Smith, they're probably going to have access to the draft again. I think what they should be looking at is probably the free agency market. I, I think, you know, by all means, draft well. They've done that well over the years. Bit of help through free agency and father-son, Sam Darcy and Jamari Eaglehagen. But take your first round pick and, and see what's out there. Like there's a McCluggage, there's a Ben Ainsworth. Again, I don't know how realistic it is, but that's probably still a part of the list they need to bolster. That actual middle part of the, the list is probably the most lacking particularly in important positions like the midfield. I think that's what they need to replenish first. There is also the elephant in the room. There is a Bonton pelly shaped window for the Western Bulldogs. And it's a little bit like Fremantle with Nat Fife, and ultimately they didn't go down that path. And what I mean by that is when you've got an amazing player in Bonton pelly like I believe they do, that comes with this implied pressure of how do we capitalize on this while he's on our list? They already have a premiership with Bonton Pelly, and that was well before he hit his prime. So do they make moves to try and, you know, top up while he's there? I think there's a way they can do both. I think I think there's a way they can take a first round draft pick this year if they lose Bailey Smith and, you know, attack free agency. Now I've done a lot of list analysis in this video and haven't talked that much about beverage. To conclude my thoughts on beverage, overall, the expectation on the club is a little bit overblown externally. However, you have to consider, though, that the club probably has a very pragmatic view on where their list is at. Not only are they close to the action, but they've been there for all the drafting. And it seems like the Bulldogs have had an eye on this tra list transition for a while. When you consider, you know, aggressively trading to get into the top six last year for Riley Sanders, they would be well and truly aware of this young burgeoning crop of young talents that I personally rate. And therefore, maybe they are pragmatic about where they're at. But what it comes ultimately down to that is so hard to quantify from the external is how much do the players want to stick around and play with beverage. There's been a lot of innuendo and I'll stop short of really speculating on that. Beverage comes across as very a combative and a little bit disorganized and sometimes he doesn't make sense in his press conferences and he, he kind of reminds me of Wusher but probably even more exaggerated where he just seems angry to be sitting there <laughs> and that can sometimes distort perception so at the end of the day is beverage the right guy for them you know i respect bulldogs fans perspective probably more so than my own but he's proven he can get there he's proven he's a good coach but if they're now in a current point of time where players are not responding to him then that is ultimately what will decide it but as far as expectation goes and their ability to hit those expectations, I think having done this analysis now that the Bulldogs should be looking a few years into the future and not so much right now. But like I said, I do empathize with the Bulldogs fans who have watched them lose a lot of close games last year, bottle winning positions, bottle positions where they're about to play finals and they've missed. And I understand that for sure. But I think this analysis has opened my eyes as to where they actually are in the premiership window. But let me know guys in the comments section, what you think, what do you think I got right and got wrong? Again, it's hard analyzing another team. I feel like I'm pretty good with the Eagles. Um, and I think that I've learned some things from here for the Western Bulldogs, but by all means, fill in some gaps, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.